So next up, everyone, we're going to start to understand. Hey, guys. So next up, we're going to start to understand um, what happens when you start to move the reference points into three dimensions. And it's not going to work. And that'll be our challenge for next week is to figure out how to get it to work. OK. But first off, um, I, I do need to show you a little bit about how to break down a surface into a grid uh, when it's in a warped, when it is a warped plane. OK, so I said not just uh, build a grid, but actually break down a surface into a grid. So this is a subdivision, not a creation. All right, so basically, um, first thing you need to do is, is create a warped surface. And I don't care how you do it, really. I just need something that's not um, planar. So for me, I'm just going to go to, say, the front view, and I'm going to make a curve. Yes, I am recording. Thank you. So I, I'm doing this in Rhino, by the way. Um, pull it away from, yeah, pull it away from your, uh, your original model here. Something like this. Spin it around, and I'm just going to loft these two. There we go. Okay. So, um, this is not a planar surface. And so to break it down into a grid would be kind of annoying, right? You might think to make a waffle above it and then extrude the waffle and then trim it, right? That's not really going to work because it's not a true grid um, in the sense that it's not aligned to what's called the U and V axes of this warped surface. Okay, so think of U and V as an X and a Y, but it's happening across four reference edges that are not necessarily straight or planar or anything like that. Does that make sense? So kind of like the uh, parabola apparatus where you have you know subdivisions along the parabola and you just, yeah, anyway. Um, <clears throat> so with this, you need to first reference in the surface. And then we are going to have to subdivide it using a domain. OK, so um, it looks a lot different than this, I'll say the least. All right, so let's first reference in that surface. You go up to params and geometry and go to surface, right? So this is that empty uh, geometry. Uh, it will read particularly a surface. So right click it and go to set one surface. And we're going to reference this one in right here. Now it's going to look a little funky. Right? It's going to look like there are graphic glitches all across it. That's because um, the geometry in Rhino still exists and is still visible. And the geometry from Grasshopper is trying to show in exactly the same location. So that's why you have those you know, messed up surfaces. In order to clean that up, what I'm going to do is just go into Rhino and uh, turn off my default layer. And it'll look like this. You guys with me so far? No? All right, I'll give you a minute to catch up. So a, a quick heads up, everyone. Um, this, this is a good warning, and I forgot to warn you ahead of, uh, ahead of time about it. Uh, Grasshopper is very picky about the, the way that you create the reference geometry. So extrusions are frequently um, not really applicable. Okay, so generally speaking, you want to stick with loft um, or planar surface in order to create your flat planes. Um, so do what I did basically, and and um, like this, you can basically create two curves and then just simply loft them together, like that. Whoops. I would say stick to something that's a little simpler, like this. Um, don't don't get too crazy with it yet. That should be okay. Yeah. All right. So um, from this, then uh, the the key is that we're we're now working within a domain. Okay. So no longer is it numerically generated grid values. It's, it's a uh, proportionally and referentially divided 
grid value. Um, <clears throat> so that's found under the math tab and the domain panel. And we're going to do this one here called divide domain squared. All the way down the bottom, right here. Do I need to give you guys a couple more minutes? OK, hang on. So um, divide here, uh, there are a bunch of different types of divide. It's under math and domain. Um, but so like if you go to the shortcut and you try to do divide, you're going to get a ton of different results for divide. The one you want is divide domain squared, which is a domain function under the domain um, panel here. And it's this one all the way at the bottom, divide domain squared. Okay, this is one of those super weird ones where I absolutely have to tag it for you. Otherwise, you'll probably get very confused. The key here is to make sure that you have an I input, a U input, and a V input. Now, um, this particular component has three inputs. It's, it's a domain, right? So it's kind of, it feels um, redundant, but it's asking for a domain and then it's creating a domain subdivision. Okay, so it asks for the domain, which is the source. Um, um, it is the, the source four-sided boundary for what it's going to subdivide. Okay, so, and then it's going to ask for the U count and the V count. That's significant because what you're doing is you're defining how many subdivisions it's going to have across that domain. Okay, so um, the domain here is the surface. And, yeah, I don't know where it is on this one, but, um, and then you're going to have to, you're going to have to uh, create sliders for how many, or you can do static numbers, whatever you want, but in this case, I'm going to do 0 to 10. And then you can just pick and choose how many subdivisions you want. Now, it won't create anything yet, because... What's going to happen here is the output value here is still a domain value. Segments, right? So these are segments of a subdivision. It's the data. It's basically creating the raw data that's going to cut an actual surface. Then you need your surface cutting function, which is another very you know, hard to find one because it's named really stupidly. Um, it's under surface utility. And here's, here's really the kicker. It's called isotrim, right? The, up here in the menu, it's called isotrim. But then when you click it and you put it in the um, workspace, it's called subsurf. Super weird. Um, anyway, you're going to see this particular one almost every day for the rest of the semester. Almost, sort of, kind of. And that's because uh, a lot of what we do is like assemblies based. And so we do a lot of panel subdivisions and, and like structural armatures and stuff like that. So this is an incredibly important one. I want you to remember it. It's under surface utility. Now, this is going to ask for the surface to cut. That's this one right here, base surface. And then it's going to ask for the domain to use to cut it with. So that would be our original surface and the domain. And that's what you see here. OK, yes. That's, it's called isotrim, yeah. <laughs> Under surface utility, this one right here, it's called isotrim, yeah. Um, every single one of you, it, with your notebooks that was in the syllabus that you need, make sure you write this one down. Isotrim equals subsurf. It's essential.
Um, so just real quick before I close my thought here, I'm going to uh, turn off the original surface so you can see it a little better. But basically what we've done, and the thing that you need to uh, pay the most attention to, is we created a, a set of subdivisions that are sort of warping in three dimensions. So my particular definition was um, I had two curves that were essentially straight in plan view. But what happens when it gets pinched in a way? Um, let me turn that original layer on. Grab this curve. Pull that in. Yeah, that's good enough. That'll do. So I'm going to get rid of this original surface, and it's going to break my definition. That's okay, right? That, that just means it won't read that thing right now. So let me create a new one. Loft. Okay. Um, I'm going to assign this one to the base layer. Don't worry if you're falling behind here. I'm just proving a point about something. And set one surface, and I'm going to put this one on it. Um, So now what's happening is the, the subdivision, right? So pay attention to the distances, right? When we had a grid that was in two dimensions, like a rectangular grid um, and a square grid, they had static values. So as you followed you know, row one or column one, whatever you want to call it, um, across uh, from, and you measured the, the distance from you know, point one to two on any one of these crossbars, they were always the same. In this case, they're all different. Every single one of them is different. And you can tell <coughs> by um, your first, and this is going to be a, uh, your first foray into how we're going to reconstruct geometry later. Um, you can tell by uh, going to surface and analysis and deconstructing this B rep. Don't worry if you're falling behind, I just want to prove a point. Um, so then you have edges here. and those edges can be measured. We'll go to um, curve analysis, curve length, and we're going to plug that into edges. And then I'm just going to pull a panel in and look at what I've got. OK, so every single one of those is entirely different. And that's really, really important because now that we're working in warped surfaces, right, the, the reason I want to uh, point out the data to you here is to provide value for what you're doing. Because this information is essentially the same kind of information that went into um, manufacturing the Disney Concert Hall, as an example, and any one of Frank Gehry's buildings, right? Everything was based off of, of uh, analytical data points around which all of the uh, armatures, the panels, the, the uh, connectors um, were all engineered. So they all came from a center point about which you know, everything was engineered. Okay. Less eloquent there at the end, but you get the idea, right? Okay. Um, so I think uh, the next thing I want to show you is what happens when we're mapping geometry. OK, um, let me, you know what, I'll do that in a separate video.